The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Well, good evening and welcome to Southside Bible Church. I would like to welcome you as well and thank you for spending your Christmas Eve with us here at Southside. I would appreciate it greatly. So tonight, my desire is to bring us all into the first Christmas. I want to, over 2,000 years ago, uh, I want to bring us back to Bethlehem with Mary and Joseph to see the, the recorded birth of their firstborn son, Jesus. And my prayer is that as we look at this scene together, that God would unfold to all of our hearts here the fullness of what was really happening that day. This is the most substantial birth that has ever taken place in the history of the world. The creator of this world was born into this world. Eternity actually stepped into time. God himself entered this world. So my goal tonight is what does that mean then for me on December 24th, 2018? Could an event 2,000 years ago have any significance in my life this very night? And the answer is profound and it's life altering and it can impact your immediate and it can impact your eternity with this truth. So may God meet every one of us here tonight in a way that whatever need that you've walked in here with, that you would see that this tonight, what I'm going to share with you, is your greatest need. And that this is the answer for all the other needs that you have brought into this service. And so the possibilities tonight are truly amazing. And I'd like to go before our God together and ask him to meet us here in a special way. Father, we thank you for this Christmas Eve night. God, I thank you for what we're going to look at. I thank you for 2,000 years of Bethlehem. And I pray that your spirit would unfold that truth and that reality to every mind and every heart, that we would be able to comprehend what, what you were doing and what that means for me. And I just pray, God, that every heart would prepare him room tonight. I pray that you would reveal truth by your spirit through this word. I pray that you would be put on display for this God who is a saving God, a merciful God. God, be put on display and let all marvel and worship you tonight. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, for five weeks as a church, the last five weeks, we've been preparing uh, our hearts for Christmas. And as we've, we've been journeying through the Old Testament together, to see what, what happened that day when Jesus was born. It, it was the fulfillment of human history. And God's been, throughout the whole Old Testament, He's been picturing Jesus. He's been prophesying and telling us what, what happened. He's been painting pictures and showing us clearly this one who would come uh, into the world named Jesus Christ. And we have some amazing things that have been told to us about this one who was born on Christmas morning. He would come and he would reverse the effects of the fall that took place in Genesis 3 when the devil tempted Adam and Eve when they lived in a perfect paradise. And when they sinned, they plunged the whole human race into destruction as we've been separated now from God. And God said, I'm going to send a seed that's going to come and fix all the effects that the devil did to destroy this world and our very lives. Then we saw this man named Abraham who was called out uh, thousands and thousands of years ago. And God said, Abraham, through your seed, I'm going to bless all the nations. And we were told that, that Jesus Christ came then from the seed of Abraham. And then there was one of the greatest kings that ever, Israel ever knew by the name of David. And he told David, you're going to have a descendant. And he's going to sit on a throne and his kingdom will have no end it will last forever and ever, and this is the kingdom of God and what I will help you understand and we will look at tonight. Then we looked in Isaiah 9, and the prophet, 700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, he said his name is going to be a mighty God. He's going he's to be a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, the, the prince of peace. And so this one who's going to be born, he said, of a virgin is going to be God. And this 700 years before, and yesterday as a church, we came to Luke 1. 
And there's Zacharias there who's going to, uh, he, he got, uh, his wife Elizabeth was barren and she got pregnant as the angel Gabriel came and told them, you will have a baby. And his name's going to be John, John the Baptist. And he's going to come and he will lead the way for the Messiah who's already pregnant, uh, a teenager pregnant, carrying this one. And we will see the tender mercy of our God, he said. He's visited us. He's came into this world, and he came to bring us salvation, and Zacharias is overwhelmed with it. Well, tonight, we're going to finish up that series, and we're going to continue on in Luke. If you could put up on the screen, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Let me read that to you. Now, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. And this was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, which means heaven's bread, because he was of the house and the family of David. In order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. And while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Anything jump out at you as you read that? I think this could be the humblest birth in the history of the entire world. There's no fanfare. There's no room for them at the inn. The Son of God is coming into the world now to a very, very poor couple who now uh, can't afford a hotel room. There are none left, and they're going to go into a stable, and they're going to give birth to their firstborn son in a stable, and they're going to wrap him in swaddling clothes and lay him in a manger, a, a, a feeding trough for animals. Doesn't that kind of take your breath away? It just, to me, it seems so anticlimactic of everything we've been studying for five weeks, this promise of this king whose kingdom will have no end, and he's going to come. He's the greatest king. He's the king of kings. And now we've been waiting, and here's the climax of all of history, and all of a sudden we come to a little manger, and this baby is born. It's so surprising to me and just not expected. And I've spent my whole Christian life, really, and especially this week, saying, why? Why, God, I I just, why such a humble way for the greatest king to enter the world? What you've been promising for thousands of years just doesn't feel right to me. And this is what I hope to answer for you tonight, because the answer is Christmas. The answer is understanding the heart of why Jesus Christ came into this world, and why does it matter to you this night. So as we look at the advent of Christ, I'm going to examine three aspects of his birth. Here's your outline. We're going to look in verses 1 through 2 at the historical setting. Then in 3 through 4, I want to look at the personal setting. In verses 6 through 7, I want to show you the simplistic setting. So if you'll look with me in verses 1 through 2 at the historical setting that I've already read in verse 1. Now, in uh, it came about in those days. Well, what days? Well, it's the time in, in Luke 1, 5, King Herod was on the throne. Gabriel, the angel, had come and visited uh, Mary and Elizabeth with these miraculous births. John has just now been born into the world. His father has been mute, and now he begins praising and worshiping God. Mary's about to give birth. It was in those days that he's writing about, in those very days. In that time, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of the entire inhabited earth. This decree goes out, that's an imperial decree, and the Caesar himself made this edict that that it, it came from Rome, which is the ruling country, and it went out to Judea. Here's an imperial decree, all of you are to report to your hometown. Who made this edict? Who made this decree? Well, Caesar Augustus. That isn't his name. I just want to help you with this. Caesar, that's a name. It means king or emperor. 
And Augustus is an adjective, and it means to be esteemed or highly honored. So this highly honored king or emperor, Caesar Augustus, this decree came from the Roman Caesar. And this particular one was born on September 23rd, 63 B.C., and his name was Gaius Octavius, known as Octavian. And I'm just going to give you a quick history on him, uh, not to bore you, but I want you to see that Luke wants you to know this happened in history. His mother, Atia, was the daughter of Julia, who's the sister of Julius Caesar. Julius loved Octavius and adopted him at 20 years old. One year later, Julius Caesar was murdered. Octavian ruled with another Caesar named Mark Anthony. And Mark Anthony ended up leaving his, his wife for Cleopatra, who was the queen from Egypt. And his heart became more concerned with Egypt than, than Rome. And what followed was a battle between these two. And in 31 BC, they had this great military battle on water. And Octavius destroyed them, and he became the sole ruler. And he ruled then for 45 years. And he extended the Roman Empire greatly. And he built roads and the extension of power, and he may have been the greatest of all the Caesars of Rome. Augustus referred only to gods before he took that name to himself, and he even had the people call him Savior. So it's amazing to me, as we begin with the contrast of the two rulers in our context, Caesar Augustus is this great earthly king, and all are in submission to him, and he lives in a palace, and all bow to this man, and now comes the king of kings, born in a manger, with no fanfare. What a contrast. What a contrast that this kingdom of God would not be like any earthly kingdoms or the way that we think about anything. It's going to be completely contrary to the kingdom that God is going to establish. So Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth and, and, and ruled by Rome. And the census they did for two reasons, to enlist people into military duty and for the purpose of taxation. And this was the very first one while Quirinius was governor, the leader, the ruler. And so the part, I don't get, Luke, why bring up Quirinius? Well, I think to clarify the time of a real historical event. Everyone would have known which census this was. They did it every 14 years, and they would have said, oh, that census. So Luke continues to show this happened literally, everyone in this room, in history. It's not a philosophy of life. It's not a fairy tale. I'm tired of hearing about the spirit of Christmas. It's not a spirit. It's, a, it's heaven's invasion into history that he made. It's a divine uh, visitation into a real time in a real space. Jesus Christ entered into this world in real time. So the question I have is why would a nine-month pregnant woman in the cold of winter travel 90 to 95 miles to Bethlehem? There must have been like a deadline. April 15th, they had to get there at a certain time uh, to register. In verse 3, everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. So they're all going there then to register. So why Luke spend time on this? I want you to hear something in Micah 5.2. This is amazing. This is eight centuries before the birth of Jesus Christ. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. You're so small and insignificant. But from you... One will go forth for me to be the ruler in Israel, and his going forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. This king's going to come into the world who's existed forever. <laughs> He's eternal. And to fulfill God's word then, this baby had to be born into Bethlehem by the decree of a pagan ruler at the exact time. If a week earlier or a week later, Jesus would not have been born in Bethlehem. But in order to fulfill Micah 5.2, 800 years before, he had to be exactly in Bethlehem and he had to be born there. My friends, that is how God is controlling every detail of this world as he's unfolding his plan of redemption in this world and every detail of your life. God holds all things in his hands for his purposes, even this week that we're looking at right now. 
So do you see this and believe in it and trust in it? Augustus is the strongest arm in history, and he moves perfectly for the strongest arm in the universe like nothing. I need this when his ways are mysterious and I don't understand what he's doing. If you've come here tonight and you you can't figure out your life and some hard providences have landed, I want to come and show you the hand of providence and I'm going to show you how to come under the favorable hand of this providence by the one who was born into that manger. So there's your historical setting. The second thing I'd like to look at is look at the personal setting and verse 4 talks about Joseph and Mary then going to register. So Joseph is obedient to the government. He takes his nine-month pregnant wife saddled on a donkey, and he begins a a long trek of 90 miles to Bethlehem. Can you picture that? Any ladies here who have been pregnant, nine months pregnant, let's go to Bethlehem on a donkey. Micah 5.2, his going fours are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Bethlehem was a nothing place. It was small and insignificant. From you, you will give birth to the ruler in Israel. 300 years after David, 700 years before the Messiah, his going forth are from eternity. This ruler is going to have been alive forever. He's the eternally existing one who will take on flesh and be born into Bethlehem. God would step into time into this little small city. Do you see why Luke wants us to get this? Joseph was from the house of David. He said this seed would come from David and he would sit on his throne. A pagan ruler decrees that he must go to Bethlehem to be taxed. 700 years before, God spoke through Micah the prophet that this Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, who, by the way, this ruler has existed for all of eternity. It's just perfect in the plan of God. You can see it universally and you can see it individually now in Joseph and Mary's life. I want to look then thirdly, that's our historical setting, the personal setting, and now I want to look at the simplistic setting, and this is truly why I picked this passage for us to look tonight. So if you'll come with me to verse 6. So while Joseph and Mary were there, the days were completed for her now to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in clothes, And she laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. There's a a brevity and a simplicity to this. Here are the humble beginnings of the Son of God in the earth. The greatest birth ever comes in poverty, rejection, and no recognition. If you would have been there, I just want you to know you would have saw nothing unusual There there really is no halo above Mary and Joseph. That threw me for a loop when I got older. There were no royal garments, no angels floating, and no organ music was playing when you walked by that manger. If you would have walked by, you know what you would have noticed? The smell of dung and urine and animals with some baby crying in the midst of it. There was no room for them at the inn. With this census going on, there's no place for them to even stay. So what do you see whenever you see a hotel? You drive by, every hotel has one. It's called a parking lot. And it's the same with these inns. They, they didn't park cars, they parked their animals. So we don't have a hotel for you, but hey, if you'd like to stay in the parking lot with all the animals, you could go stay there. So there were these stables where people's animals stayed while they stayed at the inn and there's just no room. And this worn out couple from all of their travels, all that they've been through, okay, I'm going to give birth, they go into a stable. And there Mary gives birth to her firstborn son and she wraps him tightly in swaddling clothes uh, to keep him safe and warm. And she lays him in a manger, a feeding trough for animals. The Lord of glory has been born into a beast's bowl. And this would become the pattern of his life. In Luke 9, 58, it's said of Jesus that Jesus said this, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to even lay his head. In John 1, it says he created all things. 
And he came to his own, and his own didn't even receive him. His own, the Jews, had no place for Christ. I'll tell you this, if Octavian would have been born in Bethlehem, if he would have come to Bethlehem, the pomp and circumstance would have been amazing. But guys, there's not even a ripple on the earth to show the infinite plunge of Jesus Christ as he leaves eternity and comes in to this world from glory to a donkey's dish. He enters. And he's now laying in a manger. And he's going to end his stay on this earth by being naked, hanging on a cross with all the shame and abuse being hurled at him as he will breathe his last and say, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And he dies. That's the king of kings. This is no way to bring salvation to mankind. It's foolishness right from the start. But this is the absolute glory of God who has taken humble things to shame the wise and the the wise things to make people foolish and the foolish things to make people wise. This is the wisdom of God and how he wanted to bring about his salvation. And his, his kingdom is not like this world. The kingdom of God is absolutely opposite and contrary to everything of how this world thinks and how kingdoms function in this world. This heavenly, eternal one is the opposite. His kingdom is diametrically opposed to the ways and the thoughts of this world. And Jesus comes in and he tells us what his kingdom is going to be like. He tells us, here's who are my citizens. Here are those who belong to the kingdom of God. He says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. You come into my kingdom poor in spirit. You don't come with all of your resources and all of your goodness and all of your merits and all of your worth and and what you've earned in this life. He says, you come into my kingdom with nothing. You come in stripped naked, looking to me alone for your salvation. The world, every cult says you've got to bring something. You've got to go merit something to get into their kingdom. And Jesus says, you come into my kingdom with nothing. You come as a beggar holding out a cup, going alms for the poor. Alms for the poor. I have no resources to save myself. God, you alone must save. That's how you enter into my kingdom. Blessed are those who mourn. You come in mourning over your sin. You come meek. The world says you got to be a mover and a shaker and you got to accomplish things. And Jesus says you enter my kingdom as meek and lowly and humble and peacemakers, gentle. Someone slaps you on the cheek. He says you turn to him the other cheek. You, you, you've heard it said to to, uh, to, to hate your enemies and, and love your neighbors, but I say to, to love even your enemies. It's a completely different kingdom. I want you to see the kingdom of God is polar opposite to everything of this world. And so therefore, the entrance into this kingdom is not by merit, it's not by worth, it's not by your offerings that you're going to give to God, it's not by your giving, your money, you have nothing. And the only way into his kingdom is to look at this humble one who came. And he's, he's the one uh, who is the door into this kingdom. And I want you to see that he came and made a way to this kingdom. And this king didn't enter into a palace. He entered onto a cross. Because sins must be punished. This king went and hung on a tree as God poured out His full wrath for our iniquities upon His own Son. He did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all. That's what this King did. He drew every last drop He he poured out for sinners so that your sins could be forgiven. He made a way into the presence of God by dying on a cross and living the life that all of us should have, fulfilling righteousness, This kingdom, Jesus does it all. He makes a way for you to come into the presence of God. So instead of you bringing all your stuff, now you come with nothing. He says, those are the ones who enter into my kingdom. Meek and humble, none of your goodness, none of your merit or righteousness. You come with filthy rags to come to the king 
and say, save me, cleanse me, bring me into your presence. The king of this kingdom is different than any other ruler who's ever existed. And I want you to hear this when he, Matthew 28, he says, I've been given all authority. I have authority over everything. You, you would expect him to be haughty, pompous, everyone just make a big fuss. This king is the king of kings with all authority. And he comes with a humble heart. He's kind and compassionate and merciful. And he will lay down his life for his people. There's never been a king like this. And here's the gate of salvation. This king comes, he makes a way, and now I want you to see the beauty of the manger this night. The manger is the gate of salvation. It, it leads to a cross. It leads to the work of Jesus Christ. And so the manger tells us he did not set the bar so high that no one can come in. He set it as low as a manger that we might come poor in spirit and humble and lowly to the king tonight, boasting of nothing, but that we are the greatest of sinners to come to that king for entrance into his kingdom. So I pray that you see that this night. This king stood up one day and cried out to the crowds, come to me, come to me, the king, the entrance into the kingdom. All who are weary and heavy laden, all who are trying to get something to give to him in order to be good enough to get in, come to me. If you're weary and heavy laden with trying to keep the law to get in, and I will give you rest for your souls. For I am gentle and I'm humble in heart. A God who is humble in heart. He comes holding out humbled, pierced through hands, saying, don't be afraid. Be afraid of not coming. Come, come to me, this lowly, humble Savior who is able to save to the uttermost all who come near to God through Him. Be afraid of not coming to that one. Come to me. Humble Jesus Christ, the King of kings, born in a manger. Come. Don't be afraid. Come to me that you might have life and be brought safely into the presence of Almighty God. Come. Salvation has come to us. He has come and He has accomplished salvation. He has come into this world born as a man, to die as a man, to obey the law as a man, to save us and bring us into God's presence. The veil when he died was torn in two because his presence has opened up again for us. Come, come, be safe. I've come as a manger. I had no place to lay my head. I've died on a cross for you. Come to me. Come that you might have life. Why will you perish when I have the bread of life, Bethlehem, uh, heaven's bread, I'm the bread of life, come to me and I'll give you eternal life. Does this Christ have a place in your heart here tonight? Do you have a no vacancy sign in your heart like everyone else that day? There's no room for Jesus. I don't need him. Are you like the rest of the world that day who are just too busy for the king who was born in the world, who was a savior. I'm full. I'm full of my life. I'm full of my job. I'm full of trying to get ahead. I got to climb that corporate ladder. I'm just full. I don't need you. I'm full of self. I'm full of all my plans and my goals and what I got to accomplish. I'm full of my own righteousness. I'm so good. I don't need a savior. I'm full of goodness. I'm telling you. Is he on the fringes tonight of your heart and your affections? Is he relegated to an outside place? I just, I just want little parts of him. I just want a little makeover, not a takeover. I want to play around, but when I am in need, man, I'll pray to him. But this Christ is outside taking over the King of David, ruling and reigning over my heart this night. I give you pieces, parts. I won't give you my whole life, this humble king 
who has now been raised the King of kings, seated at the right hand of God in all authority. I love the hymn, O come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room in my heart for you. Come. Is Christ the center stage tonight? Has the last five weeks of our study brought you to this place? Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy, for thy courts above. All to Jesus I surrender. Please, don't set him aside. Don't be like the innkeeper. So many people, so little time, I don't have time for Christ. Imagine all the people in Bethlehem, they're talking about the taxes. Do you want to hear people grumbling about government? I bet they were just teeing off. Can't believe this. We had to give up our whole lives for weeks and months to travel to get taxed. Can you believe this government and the Roman rule and how unfair it is? And maybe they're drinking all night in the bars in Bethlehem. I don't know. They're, they're partying so they might feel better. They're, they're, they're going on with life. When something of this significance has happened that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. How do you go on with your life as is when God gave His Son to this world to give you eternal life? Open up your hearts to this King. If you've come here tonight, I don't care if you've come to this church for 20 years and you've never come to this Christ. Maybe you're feeling this way, and I did this for a season. How, how can Christ find a place in my heart? How can He find a place in my heart? Well, He came to the lowest place on earth. I want you to look tonight to a manger. <laughs> he came to the donkey's dish. He wants you to know that He will come to the lowest filthy heart if you will repent and receive Him. He'll come all the way. He came among sinners. He identified Himself with sinners. He died as a sinner. Saying sinners, He, he was called the friend of sinners. Come. Come to Him. Come. Filthy hearts. Don't clean it up. Come to Him and He will clean it up. Don't hide from Him. I don't want Him to see what's in my heart. He already knows what's in your heart. The one who knows every heart perfectly said, come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest for your souls. He knows your heart perfectly this very night. He, has, he, he was birthed in the smell of dung and animals. Will the smell of your sin keep him from you? Come. He said, I didn't come for the righteous. I came for the unrighteous. It's not the, the, the healthy who need a doctor. It's the sick. I've come for sinners. Don't sit and say, I'm too great of a sinner to come to Jesus and receive His salvation. That's what I came for. The good people will not come. But I'm looking for sinners who will come to the humble one for the salvation that He offers this evening. Call out to Him. He will condescend. He will come to you. He will come and save you and clean you up. Please don't think the love of Christ cannot condescend to your sinful need. The glory of the gospel is you do not need to climb a ladder to God. You don't have to get on the rung of the Ten Commandments and climb to God. He came to earth. He came to you and kept the law so that He can now come and bring you to God. He can bring you right into the presence of God this very night. That's what He came to do. He has condescended so that you might ascend to heaven. He's come to give you a gift so that you will come to God and be saved and adopted and loved eternally. Come to this one. Don't stay away. This manger scene bids you to come to the sweet, humble Christ and be saved from the full justice of God for sin. Come. And the one who will not come will have to stand under that justice of the God who knows your heart better than you do. Every sin, will, none will be forgotten. You will stand before that justice without a Savior. Why will you perish when He's come and He died and He did all of these things to save you? Why would you stand before God without Him? draining 
the wrath of God for your sin. Dying in your place so you don't have to. That's the glory of Christmas. Don't miss the message of Christmas tonight. Repent. Repent for thinking all wrong about God and how to get right with God and your sin. Repent. Turn from it. Wrong thinking and wrong living. And believe in this one that was born in a manger that has died on a cross and now seated in total victory, ready to save all who will call upon him. He'll save you this very night if you will call with nothing in your hands, no goodness, nothing. Just hold your hand out to God and look to Jesus Christ and believe. And you'll be saved. I'm going to be up front afterwards if anyone wants to talk more about this Christ. I want you to wake up tomorrow morning and have the first Christmas where you actually know what happened. You've been saved. This Christ is yours. You opened your heart. You've received him. You've prepared him room. Don't let religion and a long time of being in churches get in the way of being saved. I want you to wake up tomorrow with the fullness of what God has given to us in Jesus Christ. So if you want that as well, there'll be some leaders up here, the people maybe who brought you or whatever. We, we want you to know this Christ. I have no other motive than to see you reconciled to this God, adopted and loved and adored forever. Let's pray. Father, we, we marvel at this manger scene. Nothing else makes sense of why the Son of God would enter in such a humble way. God, it is a humble Savior, a humble God, who, who invites people to come with nothing humbly and invite people to enter into a kingdom with a humble king and humble citizens God, I thank you for the beauty of this kingdom and this gospel and what you offer this night. God, let no one set it aside. Let them not be so busy they don't want to deal with this. God, their soul is going to live forever. Don't let them put this off. God, deal with hearts this very night. We cry, be a saving God to souls tonight as they call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in that precious name that we do pray. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.